I'm going to talk briefly about data because our topic today is about data privacy. So I'll tell you briefly how as Credit Info we are using data to make decisions. I'll be talking about both traditional and alternative data and uh, I hope you'll enjoy the session. So this is one of my most favorite quotes. Who's seen it before? Who's seen it before? Wow. What does it tell you? In God we trust, right? All else must bring data. So basically in a nutshell what it says is everything revolves around data. We are getting data every day. Every day you wake up, you call for an Uber. That's data, right? You get on social media, you start downloading stuff, you start reading your news on, on social media as well. That's data. So data is basically everywhere. So how long is a minute? 60 seconds. What happens in 60 seconds? Right? A minute, I found out the hard way that it's, it's a long one while you're trying to do a plank. But in an internet minute, a lot, a lot happens. So in 60 seconds, in 2019, you, we have 1 million logins to Facebook. Okay? 188 millions are sent within one minute, just 60 seconds. And you can agree with me that this wasn't the case 10, 20 years ago. So data is evolving every single day, and it's evolving at a very, very fast rate. So what do we do about this data that we are getting every day, everywhere, on our devices? What do we do about it? Yeah. There are other sources of um, data that we consider to be alternative data. So data about utility, how you're paying your water bills, your electricity and all that. When you swipe your card, the information that uh, is picked, that's still data. You might not be aware that you're sharing that information, but that's still information that's being, uh, being picked that could be used to make alternative decisions on whether to lend to you credit or even give you a product, right? There's social media data, Twitter. Right? The hashtag, credit info fireside chat, that's information, right? It's information that can be used to do marketing, for example. Government registries, how do we verify that Nancy Kinyanju is Nancy Kinyanju, right? We have things like IPRS, which is the government registries for national IDs as well as company registrar information. So those are just some of the few data sources that uh, we might have access to. And this picks up from what I just said, the difference between traditional and alternative data. So your traditional data is data on how you're repaying your loans, right? The data that's commonly found in the credit bureau. So if you've never had a loan before, right, you basically don't have any traditional data. So we call you a credit invisible kind of a customer or a thin file customer. Traditionally, or as it has been over the ages, if you're a thin file customer, you're considered a very high risk customer. Why? Because you cannot be able to prove your credit worthiness. Not necessarily because you're high risk, yeah? But because you're not able to prove that you can take credit and be able to repay it on time. But what has changed over time? You started getting other data that can actually speak to your ability to pay off a loan. For example, if you take, uh, if you have your M-Pesa transactions and you say have postpaid bills, you pay your postpaid bills on time, you never have Okwa Jahazi, or if you have Okwa Jahazi, you're going, you pay it on time. All that information is information that can help us build a profile on you and speak to your reliability as a borrower. So that's, that's one of the many alternative data sources and it's actually, helps lenders to have a wholesome view of their customers and are able to segment the customers and be able to give them uh, products that uh, make sense to them, okay? So why alternative data? As I just said before, alternative data is opening access to credit to people who, are, who could not access that credit before. Why? Because uh, they were deemed very high risk because they didn't have a way to show that they can actually pay a loan if given that facility. So it has also opened up, and you can agree with me, financial inclusion in Kenya, especially with the onset of digital lending. A lot of customers are now able to access data or rather access loans to be able to aid in their everyday lives because 
traditional or rather digital lenders are using alternative data to score this customer. Whether or not the customers are consenting to the use of that data is a topic that Tonya and her panel are going to explore after this. Uh, alternative data as well, it, it, helps, it opens up opportunities to turn those customers into valuable, into valuable customers. So customers who could not be reached before, you're able to reach them and you're able to extend more credit to them right now. Uh, alternative data is also used in fraud management, right? Right now in the age of SIM swap yeah, and digital theft, how are you using alternative data to make sure that the customer that's actually coming for your product is a real customer that really wants that, that product? So as credit info, how are we using both traditional data and alternative data? Because in as much as we'd want to say that the hype is all about alternative data, the traditional data still is very important. It speaks more to your character and your ability to pay. And with all that, we combine both uh, the traditional and alternative data to provide solutions across the entire customer credit life cycle. So we do have risk management uh, solutions, benchmarking solution. So any solution from acquisition to account management and to collections management. I'll go through this, uh, just a few of them in the next few slides. And I'll start with risk management. So how do you know that the customer that you're going to extend your facility to is going to repay you, right? For, especially for a customer who's never borrowed before. So they don't have any history. So you don't know whether if you give them your facility, whether they are ever going to, to pay you. So what we do is we create models called credit scoring models that are statistical models that predict uh, probability of default for a customer. These models use both the traditional data and sometimes a bit of alternative data if the lender has that information. So that alternative data in this sense, it helps enrich those uh, credit scoring models to, for us to be able to have a higher probability of defaults. Or no, to have high predictability when, when you're using those models. Uh, you also uh, we could apply policy rules. You can think about it as your business rules. The data that you're having, what is it telling you about your portfolio? For example, if data shows that uh, in Kenya, people aged under 25, between 18 to 22, tend to default more than the rest of the population, what do you do? How do you change that policy law? Yeah? So using that data, you change that business rule and put it in your engine or in your credit appraisal process to say that anyone who's less than 25 should not be given credit or should be referred for someone higher to look at that application and make the decision whether to lend or not. So that's just one bit of data. We've used data of birth to make a policy rule change. Um, fraud prevention. How do you know that the customer that's applying for a facility is actually the customer that's applying for that facility, right? Did they pick someone's ID and register a new line and are able to pick that information? Right? So that is data, two data points there, a national ID and a telephone number, right? The next one speaks to account management. So how do you know how your portfolio is faring against your peers, right? You want to introduce a new product to your customers. How do you have information on how you're going to approach that target market for, you to, for, for your product to actually make sense in the market. So we have something that is called benchmarking report that basically shows you reports to compare you against your peers. What's your market share vis-a-vis -vis the rest of your competition, right? What's your default rate for the guys that you've already given a facility? Is your default rate higher than the market or is it lower than the market? If it's higher than the market, why is it higher than the market? What are you not doing right, yeah? Marketing effectiveness. Are you just throwing out ads without having to target your customers? Are they going to pick the product that you're trying to offer? So data would help you actually make, make these decisions effectively. Again, marketing, propensity to buy. How are you making that information? For a customer, especially for 
if you want to introduce a new product, or for example, in a retail, every day when you go shopping, we are swiping our cards, right? Your bank has that information. They know, for example, if I swipe my card at this petrol station twice in a week, I most probably live around there, right? Or I shop at Carrefour at Junction two, three times a week. Is my bank sending me, is my bank sending me products that are targeted to me? Perhaps there's a sale going on at Carrefour that has Tanchard, right? If you're a Tanchard customer, you can get a 10% off. Are we doing that? No. But we have that information. We have the information because I swipe my card every day. You know how much I spend and you know where I'm spending it to. You have that information, but are we targeting our customers proactively to just with the right products? Okay? The other one that speaks a lot to marketing, a bit about fraud and collections. Let me talk about collections. Once you've given, for example, you've acquired your customers, you've given them a facility, you've done your account management with them, but for, for some instance, they went into default. How do you recover your money, right? What, what data are you using to make sure that you're getting your money back without having to use too much money to get that, right? How do you prioritize your customers? Who do you call first, right? Who do you send a text to? Who do you send goons to to recover your money? So all that information you can get using the data that you have. From the credit bureau, you have information about where guys are, uh, people are picking facilities from. So if, for example, I owe Barclays and I'm not paying Barclays, but I just got new credit from housing finance, that alert, that to, to Barclays, that's a very good alert. This, this customer just got new money and they can be able to pay me back the money that they owe me. So these are some of the things that we, that you can, some of the products that we create in Credit Info using the data that we collect from the customers. So, big data is the buzzword right now, right? Everyone is talking about it. We are collecting data every time. Every single day we are collecting data. You just saw how, how much data we collect in 60 seconds. But what are we doing about it, right? It's one thing to be data heavy, and there's another thing to be insight heavy. Your data has to make sense to you, yeah? So data is silver, but interpreting is, is pure gold. And we're going to show you a video of one of our one of our products that we use to automate uh, decisioning for our customers across all the stages of the credit life cycle. Karibune sana. Credit data analysis and risk management can require a lot of time and resources. Credit Info has developed a new state-of-the-art platform for automated decision making. The platform evaluates loan applications and any type of credit-related data from data sources such as credit bureaus, payment service providers, and open banking. The platform ensures credit data usage with Credit Info Risk Management Expertise Incorporated. But this is not only an IT platform, but a productive cooperation with Credit Info's experts, full risk management support, strategy reviews, and long-term engagement with access to the best practices in the area of decision-making. Thanks to the full support of custom input data of any structure and complexity, credit limits, loan decisions and internal scoring implementation are resolved and instantly calculated and returned through IDM. You can use your own strategies, adjusted to your needs, allowing you to significantly reduce cost, time and effort. The tedious manual work is eliminated, and so are human errors and manipulations. Simplify your workflow with IDM. Credit Info. Uh, and with that, I would like to invite Tonya, who will invite her panel, and then the session can officially begin. Karibuni sana. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Um, while the panel comes on stage, and I'll allow them to introduce themselves when they get here, I forgot to mention that Fidi, who's sitting in the corner over there, has um, prizes to give out to people. So the prizes are based on who's tweeting the most, who's tweeting well. So I advise you to remember the hashtag, which I think was hashtag credit info fireside chat. 
please get on, online. Um, I think the password will also flow on the screen for the Wi-Fi in case you want to use the Wi-Fi. But please, you know, share the word of what we're doing today. Um, I think that, you know, it's the best way for you to show your appreci appreciation for the event today. All right, so thank you very much. And without further ado, I'd like to move on and introduce our panel. And I will start with Fiona, who's sitting next to me. So Fiona, just, you know, two minutes introduction, what you do, who you are, and then pass the mic along. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Fiona Makaka. I am the Data Protection Officer in Safarico. Um, as we interact, we'll, you'll, get to know to, you'll get to know what I do. Good evening, all. My name is Angela. Um, yeah. Can you hear me now? So my name is Angela Nganga. I'm the Government Affairs Director for Microsoft in Middle East and Africa Emerging Markets. Um, essentially, I, I cover or I head a team of government affairs professionals um, that basically advance ICT policy across Middle East and Africa. So we work very closely with governments to try and help them to understand uh, what are the needs from a digital transformation perspective for the policies to actually be in tandem um, with, of course, where we as users and organizations want to use technology. Um, at the same time, we also work um, on to assist our customers. So we work very closely with our customers to help them uh, address their governance risk and compliance concerns, even particularly as they begin to um, use technology um, within their digital transformation journey. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nita Omanga. I'm the immediate outgoing uh, risk manager at Visa. I've been at Visa for eight years. I just left three weeks ago. Um, for, previous to that, I've been in payments for a total of about 23 years, um, card payments. So my area in <coughs> data is really around data security, and uh, we will talk more as we go along. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm April Oichoye. I have a slight throat issue, but it's getting better. Thank you. And I'm um, the managing director in Fosphere, and at the same time, I'm the research director, Isaka. My core area of expertise is cybersecurity, information security, basically. We'll talk more as we proceed. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. So to kind of set the scene, um, our talk today is on data security and data protection. So let's just talk about every day for starters, right? And everybody's experience. And, and how do we as individuals get more savvy or, or how do we take the power back, right? So a very general question for the crowd. And I'm not directing it to anyone in particular, but I'd like for you to pick up the mic and be able to speak and I'll pass mine on as well. So you want to start us off, Nita? Yeah. Um, so just something similar to what you've mentioned. There are some buildings or some facilities where they actually scan your ID. Now, not only do they have your ID number, or you have, they have the digital imprint of who you are. And um, I've come across these once in a while, and I really put up a spirited fight because I demand to know, first of all, you cannot just scan my ID without informing me. I've given you my ID in good faith, like you said, because they wanted to give me access to the building, but they need to know that they must inform us as the owners of the information before they take, and especially digital imprints with that. So my challenge back to individuals or citizens is that information belongs to you, yeah? That is your information. So in some cases, we have to fight back and demand to be told what they're doing with this. And she hands the mic to me. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. And I think that's um, there's a couple of things, um, you know, Tonya, to the topic that you've said, which is really about where we are in the future. Data is the new oil, as they say it. And so, you know, we are going to, as the global economy you know, shifts, the truth is, and everything is going digital, um, we definitely have to figure out how do we build trust in that ecosystem? Because the issue will not be about not providing the data, but how do you ensure that as your data is being collected, 
as it's being used, as it's being processed, that um, it takes into cognizance your rights as an individual and as the owner of that data. And I think that's the fundamental thing that you're speaking about. When that camera takes your image, where does that data go? What do they use it for? Right? And I think we've seen that even if you think about just our most recent example, the apathy around which we handled the situation around Huduma and the Huduma number. And the whole issue around Huduma was not that we don't want to get counted, but the question many people were probably asking themselves is what else is government going to do with that data once they collect it? It's an issue of relational trust. It's about how do we build trust back into that ecosystem. And this is increasingly becoming the big challenge today, particularly when we have cyber threats, we have cyber crime, and we need to figure out, I think the fundamental thing is not about whether, because it's either we send ourselves back to the dog ages and say, I'm not going to give my data, which is not possible, or we think about what are the right systems of trust to build, which includes and ensuring that we have the right policies. It ensures, it, it includes ensuring that our products are safe. It in, in, entails us also ensuring that, you know, security becomes, you know, um, almost at the apex of how data is managed. So I think those are sort of some of the fundamentals that I would think of, but I'll hand over. Yeah, and, and before, before you speak, Fiona, because I know, you know, you'll, you'll make a few comments on this. I think you're right in the sense that trust probably underpins the whole conversation, right? Um, I, I personally think that this whole opt-out is a fallacy. I, I don't think it actually works, right? And so the reason why I said before you hand over to Fiona, so, so I looked at my phone today and I realized that I'd gotten three messages from Safaricom, right? Um, the first one was about the chatbot Zuri, who I was like, okay, whatever. And then the next two were about 1,000 shilling notes, one in English and one in Kiswahili. Can I, I mean, like, I want to trust you, but, but I'm not convinced that, and this is not necessarily about Safaricom, and, and for everybody's purposes, I promise Fiona, we were not going to talk too much about Safaricom today. So let's go easy. But, but is there a way in which we can actually build, and, and we'll touch on policy in a few minutes, but how do you make people feel that they can trust you with their data? So you represent an organization that's humongous that serves the majority of this country, and there's still a trust issue. How can we trust you as an organization? Yeah, so I really believe the, the issue of trust is, uh, it stems from culture and sensitization. Um, even when you look at GDPR, uh, well, not GDPR, let's talk about data protection bill. It's a mirror reflection of GDPR, but you see a situation where they didn't tailor it strongly to the Kenyan market. So you're talking about trust. Maybe uh, for GDPR it would work because, oh, sorry. <laughs> GDPR is General Data Protection Regulation. So it's an EU regulation, but it does have some extraterritorial effect here and there, especially if you're handling data for EU citizens. So it's also best practice. It's, it's, it's been adopted as best practice. So you find all the local laws reflect uh, what is in the GDPR. But my issue with the data protection bill and how it won't, it might not achieve the trust is because you get a situation where they tell us, uh, get this consent, get, um, put this in the terms and conditions, put a privacy statement. But if you look at the market, um, you know, maybe 50% of the, customers or the citizens are illiterate, or maybe not illiterate, but numeric, nu numerically illiterate. So they, they will know USSD and they will know 600 shillings, but, but they can't read. So you're putting those terms and conditions as a tick box. You see, so it, it might not achieve the trust. I think sensitization would, uh, would achieve the trust. But to, to throw a spanner in the works in your your analogy of, of you, you went through Langata Road and you see, even today, uh, and, and everything I'll give here is just for purposes of uh, demonstration. So today I woke up, I wanted, uh, I, I felt like I wanted ice cream. I texted, I WhatsApped my friend, I told them I want ice cream. Then I saw those messages, uh, those advertisements on Facebook, you know, strawberry ice cream. And then Eat Out, the app tells me, go to News Cafe, 
uh, there's ice cream, strawberry ice cream there, and I got it. So there are two sides to this. Um, I got my ice cream. But also, did I even really want ice cream from the beginning? Or was it a, a product of, I saw ice cream everywhere and I wanted, you see? So there's the element of, there's something good out of this. You see, even for CCTV, when there's a famous politician who um, passed on, we went back to the CCTVs. So there's, a, there's an interest for the data subject there. Um, the issue is now the trust element. I don't know what you're doing, like what Angela said. Okay. So I think you bring up two interesting points. And, and as for the audience, you know, as we were sitting and having a chat earlier, we touched on, on, on some of the points that Fiona has spoken about. So the GDPR law, the EU law on privacy and data protection. We touched on our own, and for those who may not know, there's a data bill which is in parliament. There are three data bills in parliament right now. Um, and, you know, there was a bit of a, a lightly heated debate going on, and we decided to save it for the stage. So I'm going to ask you, April, um, and, and really just, you know, with all naivete and innocence, right? I kind of look at that. I, I, I fundamentally believe, and I'm listening to what you're saying and how the context in which you brought in the law, um, I believe that, you know, there's what government will do, and then there's standards that we have to hold organizations to that, quite frankly, for me, should probably be even the highest bar, you know, the highest bar, right? So we'll talk about the corporate standards, and a lot of people here are representing corporates, and that's fine, but let's talk about what the government of Kenya in this case is trying to do. Are we ready for these three data bills? Um, are they the right thing for us now? Are they well thought out? Are we just in a Me Too movement? Or are we, you know, like, what's your take on this? Okay, in all, all honesty, I think the GDPR should have been made a global regulation because it covers everything if you look at it. So everything that countries are trying to do is trying to copy, do a copy of the GDPR. And I don't feel like it's comprehensive enough because the GDPR has really covered everything. That's number one. Number two, if you look at our other laws, it's like there's a clash between the GDPR and like the Cyber Crimes and Misuse Act. For example, let me give a technical example. So if you look at section 17, one of the Cyber Crimes and Misuse Act, it talks about data, what, manipulation or something like that. And there's a fine of 10 million and five years. Then it comes to a different section, I believe it's section 27, 21, that talks about if you give a password, you are fined 200,000 shillings. That's a clash. Because if I can give a password and someone else misuses the system, it's the same thing. If you look at the confidentiality, integrity, availability goals of cybersecurity, and all of them have been breached somehow, some ways. So I feel like some of our bills are not working in tandem or in agreement with the data protection regulation. And that's why I have an issue with that personally. So I think as we are implementing these laws, we need to look at them in totality and look at what one says and what the other says and how one will impact on the other one. Number two, we've been talking about data, 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 data for the past 10 years. Fiona talked about... Fiona talked about culture. The truth of the matter is our perception of risk is built on our cultural backgrounds. And that's different across the world. In Africa, we are friendly, we talk to each other, we share cups, we share water, it's normal. So for us, it's normal to share critical information. So when you bring about stuff like the Huduma number, for example. Okay, let me not get to Huduma number first. Let me, talk about, <laughs> let me talk about these registers that we sign and leave information on everywhere, all the time, every building. Now look at the big four. Um, some of the decisions that we need to make around big four are going to be better informed out of the use of data, right? But that data needs to be mined, right? To your race, your, you know, things that can actually pinpoint to you as an individual, that's the data that needs to be protected. That's the data that you need to continue to own 
and you must have ownership of it. You must have right to have asked for it to be deleted if you don't want any... For example, if I move from a bank and I move to another bank, it is my right uh, to ask for it to be deleted. But I will not have that right if there is no law. And that's where the law comes in. So we must appreciate the fact that the need for a data protection bill is to, is to ensure, is to give us power as citizens to have a right over our own data, but also to come up with uh, very clear guidelines for organizations on how they are expected to treat data, how they're expected to process data, how they're expected to store and manage data. Yeah, um, sorry, thanks. So yeah, I have a point, just a rejoinder on what you said. Um, I agree that your ID number is public, but in a country like this, really, for a transaction, what does one need? They need the ID. So I'm very sensitive about people who take, who have my ID, my ID number and the digital imprint of my ID, because that's what you need to buy land or to sell um, assets. But I want to go back to the issue of trust. Um, corporates are doing a lot around trust. If we look at the payments industry, um, it's really all about trust. At the, the moment that trust is is eroded, consumers will switch to other forms of payments. They'll say, okay, I don't want to use this card because there was a fraud or there was, you know, something else happened. But when it comes to trust, there's also an, a, an element of blind trust from individuals, yeah? If you look at what we have today on all of our different, our phones and the different uh, applications that we have, they're listening, they're watching, they've got night vision, we don't know what else because we have authorized these things to take every detail of, of our lives. And it, it, you get to a point where you become paranoid um, when I'm at home. If I'm changing, I have to cover my phone. Yeah? It's not enough that the camera is off or that it's facing now. I literally have to cover the phone. Uh, there was a case with Samsung some years back where... Um, it was said that uh, after switching off the, the TV, it was still watching. So they, <laughs> they said you literally had to unplug it. And it was a big scandal uh, on Samsung. So there is also the point of blind trust from consumers. What are we allowing um, to take every, every, every day, every inch of our lives? They're monitoring, recording, and we don't know where that is going. Okay, thank you ladies. I want to touch on a couple of things that you mentioned there. So, words I picked up, um, need for governance, if you don't mind just turning off the mic, I think there's a bit of feedback. Need for governance, there was one that jumped out at me which was watertight laws, right? Um, and uh, is, is privacy an illusion and maybe it doesn't matter. And I'm just kind of exaggerating for emphasis. So, I mean, you know, a lot of us play in the technology sector, right? And a lot of people in this room are fans of innovation and that sort of thing. Um, I listened to the contrast between GDPR, right, which is privacy by choice, I think, versus what happens in the US, which is opt-out, uh, uh, opt I think that's what you said, an opt-out option, right? And I wonder, you know, is there a balance that can be created, right? Because I almost feel like with these hardcore watertight laws, that there's a danger that they stifle innovation, right? And where is the balance to be found? I mean, you've spent time in the payments industry. You've been, you know, you work in an innovation company. Um, what are your thoughts around how do we strike the right balance in order to continue allowing a system that allows for creativity and innovation to flourish, but at the same time, to a certain extent, allow some form of regulation, but regulation that can follow innovation and allow for the right innovation to happen. I'd love to hear your comments on that. I'll start with Fiona, I'll jump on to Nita. So Tonya, for that, I think perception is everything. So it's all about how we perceive this law. So I don't know about airtight, it's, it's not about airtight laws, it's, the, the problem usually comes at enforcement. And now when you look at GDPR, compliance should be threefold, you know, you should think about achieving customer trust, um, uh, protecting the business strategy, but also compliance with the law. So it's, it's threefold so that everyone is happy. Um, you know, compliance obviously will protect the customer, but you might be compliant, but there's no trust. The customer still feels you've not, 
um, you've not, you're, not, you're doing all sorts of things with their data. So you also have to put resources in um, custom, um, uh, um, customer trust. But you can't concentrate on that and then forget the business strategy, which is now innovation. Um, obviously, over-regulation stifles innovation. But I think we should move away from such conversations in a place where people now are talking about self-regulation. Like if you give, um, let me give an example of digital lenders. Um, you see, the, the law that was coming into play was going to be quite stifling. So they decided, let's come up with Digital Lenders Association. And they decided, okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to lobby for favorable laws and laws that are tailored. So why don't we also do that, you know? Why don't we think about Privacy Association of Kenya, you know? So that we have laws that are sound. And because uh, obviously there's stakeholders engagement with parliament, but um, it's different when you're regulating yourself and you're, st you're setting standards. So I feel like we'll forever be playing this uh, song of uh, regulation versus innovation. It's time we stop and we do something about it. Um, yeah, I think that um, it's very important that security be brought in in the development of these products and services at the very beginning to make sure that the data is protected from the source and it shouldn't be an afterthought after this uh, product has been rolled out. If you look at something like the Internet of Things, um, people's fridges are ordering milk um, out in, you know, in Western countries, the, the garage will open, the, the garage door will open itself as the car approaches, the lights will go on, the doors will open. Now what happens when this data falls into the wrong hands, yes? And the same goes with payment data. What happens when the data, it's, it's enough to say that maybe we don't know what is being done with it, but imagine it falling into malicious hands and the damage that it can do to, to states, to countries, and to individuals. So I think bringing in the security factor at the very beginning is, is a key component, and another on another point that you mentioned much earlier is the standards. With all of the um, innovations that are coming up today, is there any standard? Everybody is rolling out their own product, their own solution, and there actually isn't a common standard, and there isn't even a common language. And that brings challenges because this is unregulated territory. Yeah. So I think that is uh, once those can be harmonized, and of course it's a journey, we're not trying to stifle innovation, it will be a journey another 10 years or so, to try and harmonize all of those different developments to make sure that they can be regulated. Just to talk on the standard, they're actually international cybersecurity standards. Like for the application security, from system design at the very beginning, we have the ISO 27034 which in fact requires that every system or every application that is developed, the controls must be built around the application-specific level of trust. And there are three levels of trust. So there's the lowest level, the highest level, depending on the type of information that that particular application will be processing or the information that will be passing through that application. So I think the issue is, there are two things here. We either don't know that these standards exist so that we can implement them, but I don't believe that um, implementing security and data privacy is actually, and the, all these laws, is actually hampering innovation. I think it's a good thing. I think it should actually influence in innovation because if you understand that you can actually build a system that is trustworthy because there exists a standard and you actually implement the controls that are required, then I don't see why it should hinder innovation. Another thing, just, just to finish on that, security is both a feeling and a reality and we can't run away from that. If I feel secure, I could feel secure, but in reality, I am not secure. Or I could feel I'm not secure, but in reality, I am secure. So my question to the corporate is, how is your product looking to the customer? Does the customer feel that your product is secure? Is it really secure? 
Or does the customer feel that your product is not secure, but it is secure? So there's something, there's a conversation, there's a link that's missing in between there. So how, how should we go about it? And I think international standards are the way to go. And, and I think the law is really pushing this. Now people are supposed to comply with certain standards. It is not um, the end of the story, but it helps corporates actually push their agenda in the long run. Because if you look at it, information drives your business. Your systems, tech, whatever it is, just support your business. But information drives your business. So when you're talking about data privacy, information privacy, we must, as she has correctly said, security has to be put mixed into the ingredients and not just added at the top. Yeah, and, and Ariel, I agree with you on a high level, but you know, there's this saying that in theory, theory and practice are the same, but in practice, they're not, right? So I'm imagining I'm a young, innovative guy building my application, data, whatever, and then suddenly I'm gonna go find the ISO, whatever number, that, I mean, like that just doesn't sound like the way innovation happens. Never mind that with new technologies every day, you know, you, you don't really know where the gaps might be. So I think for me, it's just around that, that, you know, is there a false dichotomy there to imagine that the reality is that you can really do privacy by design and be perfect, but you can't really. So back to your comment on is privacy an illusion? I don't want you to answer that. I wanna switch on to the crowd and ask one or two questions. Number one, well, is a reminder to keep tweeting. I can see, you know, stuff is coming through, so that's fantastic, so keep tweeting. But I wanna shift gears into corporate governance. Um, I heard wonderful remarks here that say corporates are doing many things. I don't know if we all agree with that or how we feel about that. But just by a show of hands, how many of you work at a company where um, you have private data privacy, data security training, as an example? Just by show of hands. <laughs> okay. In how many of those companies is it mandatory to take the training? And I'm going to tell the Microsoft people to put their hands down already. Of course you have it. Yeah. Okay. Like, like we've got three or four people in the room who've put up their hands. And I think that that's, you know, I'm, I'm coming back to the point made about corporates doing many things. But it does, it seems like in theory, okay, but theory and practice not being the reality. So I want to bring back the question to the, to the panel around from a corporate's point of view, you know, I was speaking to a friend of mine who um, recently is sitting on a board and apparently, I didn't know this, but the law in Kenya is that as a board member, you are not, you are liable personally in your personal capacity for some of the misdeeds that may happen in the company where you work, right? What's the state of preparedness of our boards, of management in regular, everyday corporate Kenya? And I'm not just talking about big companies, I'm talking about you know, medium-sized enterprises into large companies. What's our state of preparedness? Um, and I'd love to hear views from you. So, thanks. thanks. Maybe I'll start with um, our vision as Microsoft, which is probably, as you said, we're probably at a small niche um, um, in terms of interest uh, around this particular topic. But then I'll also talk about what we see from, you know, most of our, or at least a good significant number of our corporate corporate customers. So if I just maybe, and maybe this could be a good, good practice or a best practice and you can pick excerpts of it. I think for us, and it starts off even with our own president uh, of Microsoft, Satya, he actually states very clearly that, you know, government's customers will not use technology if they cannot trust us. So trust is really the fundamental piece under which Microsoft's business stands on. And so without us being able to build products that are trustworthy, products that are compliant, products that are secure, um, and also being transparent about what we do with the products, our complete business model falls apart, right? And so he's taken that to, you know, right from the top, he owns that message. And as you saw by a show of hands of the few Microsoft T's who are here, we go through privacy training and it's mandatory. Um, and not just to kind of tick a box. It's basically to make sure that we all understand how important it is for us to, because the biggest weakness when you talk about these issues is always the people. 
And so you can put in systems, you can put in ISO, you can go now to 2700, whatever standard it has reached. But if you don't take the people along with you, for them to understand the importance of this, uh, you know, for, for the business, then, you know, you, you, you just have processes and, and, and tools, but you will lagger on because they will create the weakest link uh, in your organization. So he started from the top. We all own that vision. And when it comes to the products, which I'll speak to a little bit, is because when we talk about privacy by design, it doesn't really matter even if it's a small application that we are designing. It, it will not be approved unless it has met the test of whether it actually addresses the privacy of the customers that it is going to go out to. And if it doesn't, it's thrown back. So you, and I think that's where we need to start from, um, even as organizations. Back to the point that Tonya raised, if you are developing a chat, a chat box, it's okay, it's great, and we love to interact, we love to see our, our, our um, organizations or businesses that we subscribe to being proactive in trying to reach us, but if you design it with privacy in mind, then you will ask me whether I would like to be contacted in this way. And then it doesn't become intrusive. That becomes privacy by design. So there is a level of accountability that we as organizations can begin to start doing even in the way we design our own products. Are you transparent about what you're telling your customers that you're doing with their data? Some of the big tech clash that you've seen has been out of that result of people just not being, or organizations not being honest and not being transparent to say, this is how I'm using your data, and not even mandating the third parties. A number of us work with third parties. If I ask by a show of hands, how many of you have third parties working with you um, in your organizations? I'm sure everybody's hand will go up. You have a lot of third parties, and sometimes they're accessing the data. Are you making sure that the policy that you have signed in terms of the data that you're using of customers, that they abide by that. How are you checking? What are the checks and balances? So I think for me, I would say privacy by design is definitely critical. Security was mentioned earlier. How do you comply? Important. It doesn't have to be the ISO. I think it can be some simple things. There are simple tools and you know, checks and balances. There's a lot of inbid tools that have been that can actually help you be compliant. Number of times I tell people, if I and I'm not trying to do marketing, but I'm sure many people in this in this room use use uh, Windows and Office. Today, do you, you can actually be able to classify your your emails. Um, today, we don't have to even wait for admin. It's easy. The tool has already been designed with that in mind. So you can. You, there are lots of tools that actually enable you to start having some checks and balances and be compliant about how you use and access data. But if I was to go back to the last point, Tonya, you raised in summary, um, I think there's a lot more that boards can do. They definitely, they own the governance and so it's their responsibility. What we have seen in a lot of organizations is the role of the CISO coming up. We've seen risk and compliance you know, playing a more key role. I can see Safaricom with the Data Protection uh, Authority. Um, smaller organizations may not be able to have that kind of manpower. So my suggestion would be, of course, look at tools that you can actually implement quickly that allow you or add to those capabilities that you can have. But it's critical because whether it's the local laws that will come in place, we all need to have a culture of responsibility about how we use data, how we manage people's data, and how we, you know, and, and, and how we keep it secure. Yeah, um, <laughs> so I agree with Angela, and simply because she has mentioned policies, because it, there are so many policies now you have to put in place to comply, it has to come from the board. It has to come from the board and cascade down. Um, so traditionally, when a new law comes into place, it, it used to be legal or compliance, but now it's a situation where data protection, as I've said, it's a culture issue. It's, it's not just another law we have to put and comply with. So you find a situation where it has to come from from the board, and it's a situation where it's not just legal or compliance involved, but it's everyone. Everyone has to own it because everyone has a responsibility. I totally agree that it's a board issue, but my question is how many boards actually sit down to discuss information security and data privacy? First and foremost, boards understand money. At the end of the day, it's strategy. What are we making? You see? 
And still where we are, we haven't come to a point where we can actually quantify data privacy or quantify information security. So for a lot of boards, that conversation around information security doesn't make sense because they probably do not understand the, the risk and the, versus the impact in terms of quantitative measures, you see? So we need to move to the point where the boards can, first of all, understand about that in terms of quantitative measures. And it's an easy thing to do. If we lose this particular type of data that is classified in this certain way, that took us this amount of hours to generate, how much are we bound to lose? How much will it cost us in terms of reputation? How much will it cost us in terms of man hours put in? How much will it cost us in terms of protection of that kind of data? Then boards will start listening, majority. However, right now, the boards that are actually thinking around that could be 5% in Africa, I don't know how many in Kenya, and that's the reality. Because we have not found a way to effectively communicate data privacy and information security and such issues to the boards. So the issue of training of the boards comes up. Are we training our boards to understand information security, data privacy? And, and I think that's a good point. I know you yeah. want to make a comment. Um, I, I think we'll touch on, you know, is there a skills gap then, right? And, and we'll touch on that. I saw in Fiona's profile, you were the first CDO chief data officer in Kenya. So first of all, go you, well done, yeah? But, but I, I don't know, you know, is it, do, how, who's gonna train them? How, how will they know, right? Like, is there a skills gap then in this space? But I'm gonna allow you to yeah. comment and maybe Actually, you go in that direction as well. Uh, that's my point. And my question to you is, do you think that regulatory mandates then will address that issue? Because if there are mandates, and mandates are not really the best way to go um, in, in any country or in, in any industry, but if you look at something simple like PCI DSS, which is the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, introduced over 10 years ago, we are still not at the table. Yeah, we are moving to a new version, and uh, not just here in Kenya, but most of Sub-Sahara Africa hasn't yet even met that minimum standard. And the only exceptions are the countries where it was mandated. So it's just a question in terms of the skills gap, should we go the mandate way, but it's not the preferred way. Yeah, I, I, think, I think with the boards, what I would say is definitely they would need training, but I believe every board has a charter. And before any person sits on the board, you know that you are ultimately responsible and accountable for the organization. I think right now, um, in a digital economy, and if you think about it, actually the risk is much higher uh, for an organization, whether it's corporate reputation, um, whether you're talking about uh, the fines now, just think about the impact of GDPR, any organization that will be caught with a breach. Now, if you're asking about quantitative, num quantitative numbers, the numbers are there. Maybe we're waiting to get, you know, one of those locally, but I don't think we have to wait until that arm of enforcement comes in. Um, I do know that there are also industry standards. Um, so for example, with the banks, the prudential guidelines um, state that if you are outsourcing any aspect you know, of your business, you have to get the board must approve. So unless they're signing those things in their sleep, they are actually, you know, they, they should ask those questions. They should see a risk questionnaire. They should see a due diligence checklist that says, yes, we have looked at all these things and we are now comfortable that this data can move from our premise or can be hosted elsewhere or etc. etc. So I think awareness definitely needs to happen, but ultimately it's a culture of responsibility. Each one of us needs to really adopt a culture of responsibility about how, how we use data. Okay, thank you. So, Fidi, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like us to take a few questions from the audience. Um, any questions, comments, so far, feedback? We've got a question um, in the back there. Actually, hand her the mic, and then I'll share this mic on the stage. Hey, uh, my name is Otelia. I am Angela's colleague. I am not... <laughs> throwing the question to you, it's to the whole panel. Um, and maybe touching on the point of 
the, the principle behind data privacy and the cultural aspects that relate to data privacy. And I think we've had debates on both sides. Is it even necessary? Is it an illusion? It's important. Um, some people argue there's two ways of seeing it or it, it, currently two schools of thought of how we've seen the regulation happen. We've seen the Western view, which is the GDPR, which you're all saying is a very good standard. But we've also seen an Eastern approach to how data is managed um, and also how data is being used. And if we look at African cultures and a Kenyan country as, as, and Kenya as a country, um, where do we sit on that spectrum of do we want to take the, the, the route of commercializing data, in which case then perhaps the Western view of uh, protecting data and GDPR makes sense, or do we want to take the route of surveillance and protecting our, uh, our citizens as China takes and the way that they use their data? Um, what's, what's your view on that? It wasn't for me. It is definitely not for me. <laughs> no, I, I mean, okay, I'll go first and then I'll hand over, but gains are the most, is for us to be able to leverage data um, in the most effective way for our, for our region. And, and therefore, it's not necessarily about commercializing it. It's about optimally using the data to draw the best insights we can that will help us make relevant decisions. Today, we've just signed the AFTA, or rather a couple of months ago, the trade agreement. We want to work intra-trade across, across our market. If we close ourselves to, to our data and we, you know, we put borders and ring fence our data, we're already underpinning or undermining our ability to to, to be able to leverage the global market, um, whether it's in the skills from a skills or whether it's just from a trade perspective, so I think we need to be we need to be open-minded. We need to have some some very a good framework of data protection, not excessive, something that we can implement that puts the right checks and balances, um, that allows or creates opportunities or ensures there's some level of accountability and also some audit. You know ways that you can actually check that you know, data is actually being used appropriately. But I mean, today we are, let's just look at one of the scenarios that's been very topical in this country, the issue of cancer. If we went round the table, almost I'm sure everybody, if not every other person, has someone or knows someone who is battling with cancer and, and so forth. And yet we don't know what is ailing us as a people. That's a data, we need a data-driven insight. Um, I had a chance to sit in Kenyatta Hospital once with the senior management and they, they were seeing, I mean, they mentioned that every, new, every day they had about 700 new patients diagnosed of cancer every single day. Now, extrapolate to what that number looks like per year, right? But yet they couldn't figure out because that data is seated somewhere in files, right? In fact, the inpatient data is not connected to the outpatient. Maybe things have changed now. So if you're seeing an outpatient, even the transfer of your, the record when you get into inpatient, that's another manual process in terms of how that's going to be done. And after you leave there, the ability to follow up on your treatment is another story altogether. So somewhere along the line, that gets lost. And many people are accessing that hospital for their care. Now today, if someone was able to take that data that Nairobi, I mean that Kenyatta has, which has 40,000 uh, referrals on a monthly basis as a you know, just as a, the number that they had shared at the time, and we were able to analyze the data for a year, would we not begin to start understanding what it is? Is it a regional issue? Is it the water coming from a certain place? Is it food? You know, we'd, we'd start drawing some valuable insights that then takes us into the next stage of addressing the problem, as opposed to building a new oncology center in Kenyatta because we don't know, right? And so we need to be able to leverage, and today that data might be viewed as sensitive, but as you say, if we have a good data protection law that anonymizes that data, removes the name, and just allows us to be able to interrogate that data using tools, using science, that tells us what is really ailing us, then, and we can actually come, you know, make some informed decisions that will help us address the problems we have today. Same thing to housing, same thing to agriculture. We need those insights to be able to progress our economy. And it's been shown that you, know, you will increase your GDP you know, between one to 2% just by using data. So we need to enable it, we shouldn't block it, but at the same time, we need to make sure that the regulations are, are meaningful and that we can build the right capacity to actually be able to ensure that you know, data is kept uh, securely. 
Yeah, yeah, I think, sure. <laughs> I think for me, it's really about securing the data. Um, when we talk about data protection, we're sometimes not thinking about uh, the data falling into the wrong hands. So I'll just give you a very simple analogy. Imagine if um, a bank or a branch is hacked and they steal 200,000, for example, account details, it can have a catastrophic effect on that bank. So I think that uh, ensuring that the standards are enforced, um, something that I heard earlier, is extremely important to make sure that as much as we talk about it, can these companies, whether they're retailers, whether they're banks, uh, tech, tech um, fintechs, do they have the capacity to make sure that they can protect the data? <laughs> Just to add on to that, we have to come to a place where we must balance functionality and security. So which of those two extremes of laws actually speaks to us as a country? Which one works for us? Because, you see, we can't just implement a blanket law, much as I stated earlier that the GDPR is a classic, as in it's, because if I look at the Kenyan law, it's more or less a copy. They've taken a lot of, you know. However, our operations and how we do things, as we, we've repeatedly said, is based on culture. Our different cultures, you know, if you look at it, social, economic culture, political culture, religious culture, all shape how we do things. So if we are going to adopt a law on protecting our data and on data privacy, where do we fall? We have to look at functionality. Is it going to stifle our functionality? Which it can't. It sh basically, we should meet our strategic objectives as na a nation, organizations, individuals, those of you who have five-year strategic plans, we don't know what they are, in relation to your information, you see? But at the same time, you have to think about the security. So I want this tool or this information or this system to work for me. But at the same time, I must be concerned about the privacy and the security of my information. So where do I strike the balance? Which of the two, the Western view or the, you know, which of the two actually works for Kenya specifically as a country? Have we come to that realization? I don't know, because we are still implementing the law, the bill. Anyway. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Kellington Kituku, Angela's colleague once again. So um, listening to the conversation this evening, we are talking about data protection, data privacy, data security. Um, but the thing with data, and we are, this discussion is uh, pegged on, we actually know we are collecting the data. Well, you realize that a lot of the data that organizations should be pro protecting are actu is actually collected accidentally, right? It's a byproduct of the business that they do. So I'm thinking that we should start the conversation around organizations taking stock of what data are you collecting? Do you even know that you're collecting it? As you said, in terms of functionality vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the value for the same, when you're writing your name, what the organization is trying to do is implement security. They're not thinking they're collecting data. So we need to start that conversation at, do we know what data we are collecting? Are we taking stock? So probably even as we talk about boards knowing the value of data protection, they first of all need to know what are we collecting? And should we even be collecting that data? Just a comment for the panel. Hours. Um, and, and I wanna throw this question to the audience and, and ask for some responses from you. You know, when I, I put down notes and I said, should we start, does it, it doesn't make sense to me to have a data law for every country, okay? Like, I, I don't know, it just sounds ridiculous, including GDPR, right? Um, and I think cyberspace has become like what, you know, air, land, sea, you know, these things that are governed by big laws, you know, that maritime laws and whatnot. Should we have a global UN, I don't know, law that speaks to cyberspace because you're right, Angela, there is no my, my data in my space. It's all inter, intertwined with the next country or the country across the other side of the world. And for us to be in the situation where we're East versus West, c can't we come up with a global thing? I, I don't know. I'd love to hear comments from the audience before the ladies respond. Um, where's the lady with the mic? Here? Yeah. Are you gonna be alternative today? <laughs> 
Okay, so I think I'm the one who made that tweet. So in, in the defense, of how I'm thinking is, how I, I was born in a world where you put your data out there. And I, so, so I was born when the internet was there, so I'd put my data out there and I gained benefits from it. So what's the harm? Already right now you're saying we want to put up all these policies. Someone has already collected this data and they can choose to share it or sell it elsewhere. So your data is already out there. It's too late. The, the catch now comes in because of artificial intelligence. And I don't think any laws out there address how powerful artificial intelligence is into actually identifying an individual from random information. We are, we are trying to protect our PII. So what happens when my artificial intelligence is able to identify all of you at the panel and target you for certain ads or something which you may be uncomfortable with? It's not my fault that this has happened because it's, it's been programmed to learn and think independently. So we need to remember technology is an extension of our thoughts. So when you go on Google and you type something and it's auto-completing what you wanted, it's an extension of your thoughts. Already Google is already in your head to an, to an extent. So at what point do you now start saying my PIN number is very important to me when Google knows your next search? When you're doing research, all of us have done research, and you're like, today is the best day. Every tab I get, it's like, I know where I'm going. I feel like a good researcher. Google is telling you where to go. So data privacy to me died a long time ago. What should be respected is the, thought that, is the fact that technology has extended our brains and our thoughts into uh, the devices we use. And we need to be careful of who uses that data, not that the fact that the data should not be there. Even with all the laws and policies and everything, you still can't prevent, prevent someone from being malicious if you want to be malicious. So it's a question of having moral people in the right places, then you wouldn't even need these policies. So it's important that we clarify. It's not an issue of security versus commercialization. Commer even commercialization itself, the way we are using it, it's not just that corporates will have so much money out of, you know, there's value for the customer. There's, there's value in, uh, in me being told you can get your ice cream in News Cafe. There's, there's, there's value. The whole idea of data protection is give back control to the customer so that if I don't want you to tell me to get ice cream in News Cafe, I can tick and say, okay, no, I don't want. So um, let's, let's, let's get that clear. It's not an issue of innovation or commercialization, but versus security, it doesn't mean if I'm commercializing and I'm giving you customized data that your, your information is not secure. So what data protection is all about, it's not telling you don't transfer data, it's not telling you don't share data. Data protection bill is telling you um, just tell the customer when you're doing it. That's the simple, that's, that's simple, you know. I would want to know if, if you're sharing my data and, and giving something, you know, um, notify me. Give me the option to say, I don't want uh, messages, direct messages. I, I, I don't want customized messages. But, I mean, there's value to the customer. So it's, it's not an issue where you are exploiting the customer for your own personal gain. I think what I would comment here is, and, and, and the gentleman is right in that our data is out there already, um, but if you think about where technology is taking us to, um, and is the lines are blurring very fast, right? Between the physical, between the digital, uh, and even the biological, with some of the examples that we've shared here today. Think about this space that we are moving into, which is being tested at the moment of, of driverless cars, okay? If you get hit by a driverless car, who's, respon who's responsible for the accident? Is it the person who owns the car? Is it the person who manufactured the car? Is it the car itself? 
or is it the road? I mean, there's a lot of things that you have to think about. So as, as we evolve in this, in, in, the, in using technology, technology is good, but it needs, it's like driving on a road. You need some lines. Somebody needs to draw some demarcations. We need some order in order to be able to use this technology in an appropriate way and also to be able to assign responsibilities. So I think the need for some sort of frameworks um, is to help us address some of these issues that we're going to have to face in the future. You know, when you have an operation that is done using AI and something goes wrong, who's responsible? You know, we need to build in ethics or ethical policies as well when we now start using AI. So there is a need to some extent for us to have considerations around policies. They should be, you know, going back to Tonya's point, they should be uh, blockers for us to innovate, but they need to help us to think through some of the future challenges uh, of this technology disruption and help us to provide some, some order you know, or some, some governance rules that can be followed. Because without that, then we will end up in, in anarchy. There'll be, there'll be chaos. You know, when there's no rules, there's no guidance, there's chaos. So it's not necessarily that this conversation is, is, is you know, on a high because it's, there's a crisis, but we don't need to wait for a crisis to be able to start having some of these conversations because as you've rightfully said, we are giving our data on a day-to-day -day basis and we want to continue to use technology. It's just how do we create that balance, um, the balanced framework of responsibility as well as our ability to continue to leverage the technology. I will speak to what Michael said, but first I want to counter what Fiona said. Okay, first of all, there is no privacy without security. And there's no security without privacy. There are two sides of the same coin. And that's why if you look at the GDPR specifically, they specify after the general requirements, the second requirement is operational requirements and technology requirements. They require you to implement some certain operational controls and some certain technology controls. So as much as you're returning the power to me, the individual, to decide what you want to do with my data, you must secure my data if you are taking it. That's the bottom line, it must be secured. So functionality, again, and security must balance. Your application or your law or whatever must allow you to function, but at the same time, you should be able to implement security that helps you meet your objective at the end of the day. We live in, back to Michael, we live in an age of liquid information, meaning, let me just give an example. We stood outside there, the panelists, a few minutes ago and took a picture. Right now, I'm seeing it on Twitter. It has morphed. The form has changed. So we, that issue, of, we are not discussing about, okay, so are we going to create our information, which is correct. We need to understand our information life cycles. That's for sure. At what point is it created? What is it in the first place? How should it move through the organization? How should it be stored? How should it be destroyed based on the classification of that particular information? But at the same time, tech is overtaking everything. He talked about artificial intelligence and machine learning. So our information is already there, though 70% of it is unstructured, as he correctly said. We don't understand what it is, how we came to collect it, what we should do with it, even Angela pointed that out, what we should do with it. So the conversation, again, goes back to, the information is already here. We need to protect it, which means security controls must be in place, regulations must be in place, policy must be enforced. That's the one, and that's why I asked the question, is data privacy an illusion? Because any time you download an app, it asks you, in fact, if, if, if you actually research on the evolution of cyber attacks, which is why I attacked the cybercrime bill, because it doesn't, okay, this is another thing, it says, if you create a website that fishes, a phishing website, your fine is 200,000. However, if you misuse information, your fine is 10 million. What's the difference? 
That's my question. What's the difference? So we need to understand the current threats, the current cyber threat um, profile, our cyber threats, the, how they have evolved, what the attackers are looking for, what are the motives, what are we hoping to gain. Then we design our laws around that because then they'll make sense. So for me, the issue is, however we, we look at it, security must be part of data protection. Uh, my name is Mwaneki Mugo. Uh, I had a couple of questions. To probably like credit info or anyone who's collecting data, at this point in time, what legal basis do you have to collect my data? Is there any legal basis that you're using to amass all this data that I'm giving to you knowingly and unknowingly? Uh, also, in terms of uh, most of the panelists, maybe the person who works for Microsoft, do you channel my Kenyan data outside the country? And if you do, uh, what safeguards are there for me as a person in terms of my data that's outside the country? And uh, this one goes to Angela in sp uh, specifically. You talked about uh, classification of emails, but you left that, that statement hanging. So could you elaborate? Because I feel like most of the time, the applications or whatever we use, we use about 1% of the application. So yeah, I guess those are my questions. OK, so I'll start with the one for the data we collect. So OK, um, let me start by KYC data. KYC data we are supposed to collect, regulatory, you know, CA, CBK, all those things. And then there's data we collect because we need that information, or we process because we need that information in order to give you the service. So, so that's how, you know, especially KYC um, and regulatory, now, uh, you know, regulatory requirements uh, we have to abide by. So KYC details, we always have to. CA, CBK, KRA, um, and, and other data we might have to, uh, depending on the nature of the, what you've, the service that you have uh, signed up for. So there's always, there's always a legal basis. And, and you see now what the GDPR, what the data protection bill says, you can't collect something without a basis. So now that's what we have to go into. Now, when it comes to transborder transfer of data, most corporates, you know, maybe you post something on Azure or uh, AWS, so, and they use their data center perhaps in South Africa. Angela? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, most corporates do that. They host, but yeah, again, um, the safeguard is what is provided for in the law. Does the recipient country have um, equal data protection laws? That's one. Two, um, information security, the way um, April said. What, he, what, what certifications do they have? Um, do we have an audit clause? Can we go and audit for purposes of just data protection? So those are some of the things we try to, um, we try to put in place to make sure your data is safe. Um, I, in terms of financial data, um, at Visa, for example, or the other payment schemes, will only take the information that is required for the transaction. And once that transaction has been approved, the data will then be devalued. Any additional data will be devalued. So in the event that someone else got, this, uh, got your data, they cannot replicate a transaction. And that really goes, takes us back, back to the trust issue that, that exists. Okay, uh, thanks. So I'll, I'll try and respond to your two questions. I'll start with the one that you asked about the data classification. And I think I was, um, this was making reference to what, uh, what can companies do today to actually ensure that they, you know, they have some of these practices to ensure security, data privacy, is in place. And I was just pointing out that some of the tools that you currently use have already inbuilt solutions that allow for you to 
have some elements of data privacy or even security measures. And I gave the example of office or windows. Um, when GDPR, as a good example, came on board, we spent 18 months re-engineering our entire product suite. Um, huge investment, but the whole idea was that we needed to be sure that every single one of our products is GDPR compliant. So already there are functionalities which have been inbuilt into those particular products that would enable you, and not necessarily, it depends if you're administrator, so whoever buys, if you're, if you're CISO or the CIO, when he buys the package to remove the obligation from, from you as a person, he's able to, for example, if they want to classify that certain information should never leave the organization unless it is encrypted, so for example, names uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, financial information, then he can actually encrypt that from the administrator back end. It's already inbuilt into, into Office. And anytime anybody tries to send an email, as long as it has that information, it will, it'll, 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 be, it'll get blocked at the server level. So what I was saying is that for smaller organizations who may not have the capabilities to have you know, a whole ton of IT experts or IT team behind, there are already existing solutions that have already taken into consideration some measures that, that can actually help you today to be safer uh, or to at least be secure online. Same thing to authentication. We've moved from one-factor authentication to two-factor to now multi-factor authentication. All these measures that you see are just in views of, you know, trying to provide for a more sec a secure uh, access uh, to, to, to the service and to help you as a user to, to stay safe online. So that's pretty much what I, but I'm happy to take it more offline um, with you after that. As to who your data and where your data is stored, so there's two components of that conversation. So there's consumer data. So if you have a Hotmail account with us today, um, that data is, and would, is domiciled in data centers out of, out, out of this country. Then there is corporate data, so customers or organizations who sign up, you know, on, or who have accounts or enterprise accounts or other, other contracts with us. They, they have an opportunity when we are having a conversation with them to decide where they would like or which region they would specifically like to host their data. Now, it depends. There are many considerations of the, you know, when that decision is being made. There are cost issues. There is issues about maybe proximity of you know, their other locations if they, if they have a network and, and so on and so forth. But traditionally, what we have done for this region, because of the absence of any data protection regime, data for Middle East and Africa customers has traditionally been stored in the European data centers. And the reason for that is because once it's in the EU data centers, it is, of course, protected under the EU jurisdiction and under, in this instance, GDPR, which is, of course, um, you know, the highest standard available currently when it comes to data protection. We've recently, uh, as, as, as Fiona mentioned, and I did pay her to say that, we now have data centers in South Africa and we do have customers who are opting to go to South Africa. And again, part of that consideration is based on the fact that South Africa in itself has an existing data protection law. So even as we think about all the other great things, also a data protection law also secures uh, companies' interests in doing business with our own country. So if we don't have any regime in this country, we will not be able to attract people actually wanting to host their data in Kenya. And again, that could be also another, another future source of, of revenue. I have that conversation all the time with legislators. They're like, why, is, why are you not opening data centers here? We said that there's no regulation. I mean, over and above other considerations, of course. But that is one of the big impediments to, you know, to, to such investments even coming into the region. Okay, so we'll take that as the last question. Is there another one here? Okay, let's keep it short and sweet. We'll take the two. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Juliet Miner. Um, my question is, rather, let me start from what we've discussed. We've discussed uh, digital lending, we've discussed opportunities for the unbanked and for financial inclusion and informed consent. But my question is what, around what I would call forced consent. So that's where, as a user, you want access to the service, but 
you do not really have a choice as to what controls you're granting to, say, the application or to the provider. So my question to the panel is, how do you, um, would you call that informed consent per se? Would you call that allowing the user choice and control over their data? Or are they somewhat just obligated? They need the service, need, not want or desire. They really need it. And, and how do you balance that as providers or as, you know, um, experts in this area? And that, that's an excellent question, by the way. I, I want to add on to it a little bit because she's right. And we, I think it ties into your point, April, about is privacy therefore an illusion? Because in that case, people can use that opportunity to deny you the service or to, I mean, like, you, like who do my number? What's your choice? You know, are you going to say I'm opting out? You know, you can't opt out. I'd love to hear your comments on that. <laughs> Let me repeat what I said. That's why I feel that data privacy, to an extent, is an illusion. Because we have these clauses that allow certain extent of monitoring. There are certain, there's certain leeway that allows data to be used without your consent. So when you, come, when you look at it from that perspective, Okay, so fine, I can accept and say, you can use it this way, this way, this way. But have we gotten to the point now where we, we are actually informed, as Angela said, that this information will be used for A, B, C, D, and that's it. Data minimization, are we at that point? Are we just collecting data for the sake of collecting data, as I said? So I feel at this point, as we sit here today, this evening, Data privacy in Kenya is still an illusion. So uh, I'm thinking the, the data commissioner, now the new regulator, you know, they have audit rights, so they can come in and audit and make sure what you said, there are no purpose creeps and functionality creeps where you, 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 you collect this data for function one, but now you're using it for function two. Um, I feel the audit issue is what will come into play to enforce. Because even if I give you a certificate to show I'm compliant, you know, I, you know people might still be doing their own thing. So the audit, the, the audit rights that the regulator has and the audit right between uh, the partners, I think that's what will come into play. Um, but that being said, you can't give audit right to customers now. Um, it has to be the regulator. And the regulator now has to say, okay, uh, this person has um, complied. That's the only way I see. But, but does this sound like Tunaomba Serikali type of mentality, right? Um, I'm kind of thinking about it. I, I remember a few years ago, I think it was Apple, and I think maybe separately Microsoft in the US, just told the regulator, screw you. I'm not giving you this data. This is private data, and we're not giving it to you. Do you guys think that we have the balls to do that with this regulator who already is saying they have audit rights and now we're saying we'll allow them just because they can? I mean, you talked about trust, but if I can't believe that you will protect my data to the bitter end, why should I trust you anyway? Yeah? Let me answer your question with a question. So we have two laws here. We have the law from the regulator and we have the national constitution, which states that data privacy is a constitutional right. So when it comes to such things, which law holds more weight? If my data is being misused or being monitored in a way that is contrary to my right as a citizen in the country, then that's an issue. So which law, which is the highest law of the land? Those are the questions we need to start asking. And that's where I'm stuck at. Data protection is an illusion. I'll keep saying that this evening. I just wanted to add a small point to, to that. And it's a very interesting question. I think it, it introduces a concept. I think consent in some instances um, should be mandatory. Uh, and particularly when you're thinking about children. You know, for example, if you're going to, you know, um, access information or use or make decisions on behalf of children. Um, I think particularly under the age of 13, uh, that definitely would require consent of a parent. And we need to think about those sort of instances. However, where there is legitimate interest, 
for one to use the data, either in line with being able to provide the service in which I have subscribed, and hence why you have my data. Um, so if you are processing or if you are minding that data in line with being able to provide me that service, I mean, I don't want to be sent a happy Father's Day message and I'm a, I mean, come on, really. The bank should be able to figure that out from my data and send me the right message at the right time. I don't want them to send me my birthday message in the wrong month. So if they, they don't have to come back and ask me whether they can send me a happy birthday message, honestly. But if they, it is in relation with the service that I have prescribed for them to provide me with, then consent should be assumed based on the contractual uh, sign-off that I have given. And that's why those terms need to be explicit and need to be very clear. And many of us don't read, you know, and then we complain after the fact when we get the email and we say, why is, you know, why is so-and-so sending me the message? But it is your right, and that's where now the audit comes in, because as you are opting for that service and providing that data, you should be informed of what obligations or what expectations of how they will, you know, and when they, you have consented to them to use your data, or if it is in the interest of public. Um, so I would say that in those two instances, yes, but it should never, I don't think it should be assumed um, and it should not be overly restrictive. Just by a quick show of hands, who's ever read the privacy policy of the last 10 apps, websites that you went to? Yeah, lawyers, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, theory practice. Okay, ask your Hi, uh, my name is Bernadette. I'm in April in Isaka com com Education Committee. My question um, is on the topic of today. I want to ask the panelists, not because the, we don't have data protection, it's just a bill that is in Parliament. Should we be talking about data privacy now because the information is already out there? Uh, should we be talking about protecting uh, the consumer in terms of giving them information and telling them this is how you need to protect yourself? That's the first question. The second question would be then to the corporates who hold our information. How, what should be, how do we hold them accountable? Because for example, let me tell you, the other day I was going, I have a loyalty card with the supermarkets then it hit me that at the, when, they, when they print the receipt, my name appears and my phone number. I keep all my receipts and I tear the last, the, that bottom part. The other part is, like if I talk about, if I do a transaction on M-Pesa, when I pay uh, something, those people have my information, they have my phone number, they keep on sending me texts that I don't want. So what happens to me as a consumer, I want to protect my information. Because I think this, it's already out there. So how do we move now from privacy? Because it's, not, it's no longer about privacy, like I agree with April. How do I protect myself now? Yeah. Okay, let me just answer part of that. So, you know, you actually are saying what I've been saying all along. We need to sensitize the consumer, not only uh, that there's something called data privacy, but how do you exercise that right? Um, and then now on, on the issue of accountability, now when the bill comes into force, you know, you have this complaint procedure that the regulator will have put. And then also, every corporate will have to, um, to have a data protection contact. So it, it will be the normal helpline that you have to call and, and complain and then complain to the regulator. But the biggest issue is that we don't know the risks as consumers and we need to be sensitized and even taught, you know, this is wrong, you know, um, and this is wrong and you can hold a corporate accountable. That's, that's actually the issue. The culture is that we, we actually don't know what data is out there and we don't care about it. Maybe just to say that in countries where they have, I mean, there are 17 countries now in Africa that have enacted data protection laws and the authority, the independent authority, because ideally that's what it should be, that is charged with the responsibility of implementation of that law. That's their first mandate, to go out there and conduct awareness, sensitization, and let people know that the law is actually there to protect them. And that's the key thing we need to remember is that it's, this regulation is mainly to protect the citizen, the citizenry and their data moving forward. And it doesn't mean that even if your data was collected 10 years ago, as long as that institution has it, 
the minute the law comes into place, it probably have maybe one year or two years of enforcement requirement. But at some point, you will be required to, of course, show some, some levels of enforcement, either through having, you know, through the audits or any other process that they may put in place. So definitely agree with you, sensitization must happen, but nobody owns that mandate today. So there's no one with that responsibility. And until we have an authority uh, or a commission for that matter that owns that mandate, that can actually start addressing those issues, it probably just become, you know, a, a, a usual conversation. But I think it starts also with our own organizations. As we go back tomorrow, do we have privacy policies? Are we designing products in the right way? We can start by developing that culture internally within our own organizations, even as we wait for the legislative process to, to take its course. Yeah, I think I would say it starts with you. Um, because you're the owner of your, your own information. So granted that the gentleman there said it's already out there, but how then do we sit back and say, uh, okay, put everything out there. Like for me personally, I'm paranoid about someone taking over my account, moving money from my bank or moving my m -Pesa. I'm paranoid about it. Um, but what do we need to do as citizens to make sure that we are now a little bit more responsible about the information we give, we ask questions. So for example, if you go to the supermarket, you pay with your card, the transaction goes through, they swipe it again on another system. What's that, what is that swipe for? Why are they collecting your information? And you should ask questions about that. Um, I think um, also in terms of where the corporates take responsibility. It's very important that we are able to identify who's liable, in case who's liable, whether it's criminally or who's liable for negligence or if there's a financial loss, which party is liable. Sometimes it is the consumer, but oftentimes it is the corporate because if your financial data gets lost, if you look at your cards, it says this information belongs to the bank, yes? the bank was actually responsible for keeping your data safe. But as consumers, sometimes we're a little bit negligent. We go online, we're not checking that we're on a secure site, we're putting in our card data, the card gets compromised, then it becomes a tussle between you and the bank. But when it comes to payments, for example, the operating regulations are very clear that a consumer should not and cannot be held accountable for something that they did not do. So having that kind of information will empower you. Hello. Hi. Let me defend the consumer here. Because I'm one of those people who does not give my information to supermarkets. I will confess today that I always change one digit in my phone number when I'm signing those registers, working into building. It's just that I can't change my name because they ask for my ID, but I can change my number intentionally, okay? But in this case, you want to get a service from the supermarket and they're, they're offering you all these nice things that you'll get with their card. I don't see why their receipts should have your name and your phone number. I think it goes back to the corporate. Training needs to be done. Sensitization on data protection needs to be done. In companies, they need to understand that. And that's why I am for the data protection law being passed. No, 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 I agree, but I have issues. I didn't refuse. I just said there has to be some sort of synchronization across the laws. Yeah. So it, it needs to be passed because it will help the consumers protect their information. How? Because corporates will be forced to comply with all these things, data minimization. I will not use it. I will not place your info where I shouldn't place it, basically. So I support the consumer. Hello. Um, we are way over time. Okay, One. you're going to make this quick? Yes, yeah. very quick. And um, no more, the mic after that, kill the mic, yeah. All right, my, mine is about uh, the consumer. So I think all of us are talking about the fact that we need to sensitize our consumers in regard to data privacy. But what are we doing? So we have a lot of, uh, we have Angela, Microsoft, we have Fiona, Safaricom, very big organizations that have a lot of data of a lot of consumers in this market especially. So what are we doing about it? Yeah, instead of just talking about the fact that we need to sensitize, what have we started doing 
about that sensitization. Um, Anita, we are sensitizing ourselves first. <laughs> we're, we're starting from home. And then now we go into Syriaco, Piniaco, Pini, Syriaco. <laughs> Uh, mine will just be to correct the fact that we are a data processor, we're not a data controller. So at no given time do we ever access your data when it is with us as a provider of service. In fact, if anything, we just look at us as a room seated and you have the key. You, you're the one who has the key to your data. You encrypt it yourself. We don't know what kind of data we are holding. So we never access the data. That's first. And that's a principle that we have put in place. But more importantly, maybe just to say, uh, what are we doing from a sensitization perspective? Again, going back to what Fiona said, we start with ourselves internally um, by making sure that each one of us lives that culture. And so even as we have the conversations with our customers, the principles I spoke about earlier, it's one of the first things we speak about even with our customers. Any customer interaction we have, the first four things we talk about is, you know, this is how we manage data and this is how we think you should manage your data as well. So we play our role from, from that perspective. Um, I do know that there are other ways that we now help on the protection side, which is in terms of ensuring cybersecurity, um, you know, or safety. We share a lot of data with, um, on, 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 on threat landscape that we think um, governments can be able to use um, to basically help them figure out what kind of threats are they dealing with in the country and what are the right ways and mechanics that they need to put in place. So for example, if we're losing a lot of financial data, uh, we share that kind of information from what we see globally um, based on the, the footprint that we have it, when there's a, a crime or a criminal uh, activity that has taken place. So that's sort of our role from an external perspective looking in. Um, and of course the work that we do with our customers, which is of course training uh, constantly and speaking to those particular principles. Um, I think the schemes do a lot in terms of um, educating consumers to keep their data uh, private. Some of those are very simple and mundane controls that we take for granted. Don't share your card, don't share your PIN, check your statement. We, uh, we ask banks to send you an alert uh, for each transaction. We ask consumers to actually read that alert to make sure it's the transaction that took place. But also on the side of corporates, um, corporates are mandated to report any data breach uh, to the legal local authority back to the schemes, we, we report it um, internationally. So I think there is a lot that goes on, but because it happens every day, you probably don't notice it. I think there's still so much that we need to do when it comes to educating the consumer. First of all, if we look at social media and how much information we get out there, and if we look at the nature of conversations that goes on between the corporate and the consumer, for example, uh, my friend had an incident the other day. I'll not mention the name of the company, but <laughs> social engineering is a reality that a lot of consumers don't understand. First of all, they don't understand how it's done. They don't understand that your information, someone can ask for your information and it looks like an innocent question, but it's not. And if we look at our population right now, if we look at the literate and illiterate, and yet our services are offered across the country, there's still so much I think that we need to do as corporates, as we are collecting information or processing information, whatever it is that we are doing, we need to, well, let me say, we need to enhance our trainings and um, awareness sessions for our consumers. I think there's still so much that needs to be done. Good. So thank you very much, ladies. Um, I want to pause there and first ask you to give them a round of applause anyway. I was going to do that typical thing at the end where you say, what two words do you want to leave us with and what two words do you want to leave us with? But I think that there's been a lot that we've captured. 
I also think that part of the purpose of some of these discussions is to probably ignite some curiosity or spark a debate. And, and there is no silver bullet. You know, we've heard some statements here. You know, we're talking, is the law relevant or not relevant? Um, should we go east or west? Um, is privacy an illusion or a reality? Nobody reads terms of privacy. In fact, I think it should be down to three bullet points or else the rest of it is crap. Don't tell me you're telling me about privacy and so on. Um, there's need to educate um, consumers. There's need for corporates to educate themselves. I mean, we're even treading in uncharted waters, you know? Um, there's a need to balance regulation and innovation. I think that we've discussed all of that, and I really think that if there's value that we give today in this discussion is really to kind of spark that conversation around, this is our reality and it's our new normal, and how do we all, we're all participants, whether you like it or not, we're all players in this discussion, whether as a consumer, um, as an innovator, an entrepreneur, or corporate, or whatever the case may be, and it's a journey that we need to walk together. So with that, I wanna say thank you very much for being a fantastic audience. It was um, fabulous to host these lovely ladies on stage. Um, I was gonna ask Kamal why he felt the need to market it, that it is an all-woman panel. I don't usually see you writing, all-man panel, please come. So, but I've decided not to be alternative. There've been um, a lot of, um, you know, <laughs> conflict moments. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, I'm gonna ask you, Kamal, to come up on stage. I think you're doing the vote of thanks on behalf of Credit Info. Yep, so if you don't mind joining us here. Because um, they were definitely, I mean, it was definitely worth it. They were really worthy of it. Um, in terms of, Tonya, to answer your question, whole, I mean, the full women panel, mm -hmm. I think every time, this is the third time we've had a session, uh, or the fireside uh, chat session, and each time we have it, I'm told we must have gender balance. So on the last one, just in passing, I said, why don't you make it all women? And I said, ah, that's a great idea. And I said, who is the gender balance? <laughs> but anyway, um, I think there's also the fact that I believe that within our industry, within tech, and fintech, there are very many women that need to be celebrated that are not celebrated. And for, I think this was just one of many where we want to be able to showcase the talent that we have there in the market of women who are doing a lot of wonderful things in the fintech and in tech industry in this country. So I think it's more to showcase the things that you're doing as women in the industry and it's not really been recognized. And again, I don't think anyone who faults me today, that panel was actually very, very exciting, invigorating, very good discussion moving back and forth. I'm probably more confused now, having thinking that I'm a data expert coming in here, I'm probably more confused with you know, the back and forth because there are very many valid points that were raised. Um, at the end of the day, I guess data is very fluid. Um, it's very hard to say how it's regulated, how you manage it. But I think from a corporate point of view, it's all about a duty of responsibility. How do you manage that data and have you know, courtesy respect for the information you're holding on other people? Because at the end of the day, the people give you that information for you to provide them a service. So only just have the respect and courtesy to be able to do the dutifully right thing. But again, if there's I think it's um, Angela who said when there's um, no order, there's chaos. So you need to be able to put things in, in order. But that said, I think thank you all as well. The, everyone who, is, who have managed to come and attend this session, thank you very much for the support. Please continue coming for the fire set, uh, chat sessions that we will continue holding. Hopefully um, we should have another one before the end of the year. Again, like I did say last time, please do share ideas of topical issues you'd like to hear more about, and we'll, probably, and we'll definitely look into it and actually getting a good panel to come and discuss and um, deliberate on those matters as we have done today. Thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed your evening, and please don't rush. Take your time, mingle, get to know those people that are here, network. Again, that's another uh, benefit or another reason why we get people together. Let's network, get to find out what we're doing and see how we can progress each other's 
careers or businesses wherever you are. Thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone for coming. So I'm just here to award the Twitterati. Thank you so much for tweeting. We were trending number two. Um, many thanks for that. So um, Irene was doing the telling. I don't know why she's hiding behind the glass. Irene? <laughs> anyway, she did the telling. So if you thought that you, you tweeted more and you went to uh, announce the winner, she's right there by the bar. So our first winner is Laura Chite. Thank you so much. Okay, so there's uh, Joan Kinyo. Thank you so much. There's uh, Wamboi Gige. Oh, there are two Wamboi Gigas. Oh, um, Irene, <laughs> you know what? You can take Laura's gift. Both of you can just come and, yeah. Thank you so much for coming. And as Kamal said, uh, please feel free to hang around. And um, yeah, have a good night. Thank you.